Hi everyone, in this screencast we're going to cover three topics. The first is electron transport systems, the second is ATP, and the third is something called ATP cycling. The major purpose of the electron transport systems is to regulate the release of energy in a way that will be beneficial to the cell. Here's a good way to think about this. Let's say that you're in your dorm room and you're doing work when suddenly the power goes out. You're really bummed out because there are a million other things that you would rather be doing than trying to find a way to see. However, you have two choices for how to light your room. Option number one being a stick of dynamite and option number two being a candle. Option number one will provide a rapid release of energy. All the energy will be expended in one massive event. If we go to option two, however, things are a little bit different. Option two will feature a gradual release of energy. Since the wax has a high energy content, it burns very slowly over time and releases a controlled amount of energy. In this scenario, the energy takes on the form of heat and light. So here are our two options. Obviously, in this particular scenario, while option number one might be more entertaining, option number two is probably going to be the better choice. Controlling the energy as it's released is key. Releasing it all at once can be highly dangerous, as you can probably imagine by imagining what it would be like to hold both of these in your hand. Cells almost always opt for option number two because it's much easier to control. In a cellular sense, we're talking about something called the release of a high-energy electron. The cell releases many of these during the processes of cellular respiration and photosynthesis, but we don't want to release them all at once because they would cause a massive catastrophic explosion. So instead we use something called the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain controls the release of several high energy electrons over a period of time. Think about it this way. Imagine yourself standing at the top of a very tall flight of stairs. And you're holding a water balloon in each hand. As long as you're holding the two water balloons at the same height, they currently have the same amount of potential energy. They're both eventually going to reach the ground, but how they get there is going to be different. Oops. One water balloon will likely go straight down to the ground and splat on the ground. The action of the water balloon hitting the ground will release a huge amount of energy. However, you could also release the other water balloon, which would bounce down the stairs like this. Each time the water balloon hits a step, it releases a small amount of energy. The amount of energy that's released by multiple small bursts and one large burst is actually the same. And the water balloon might actually make it down the stairs intact. Cells don't use electrons for energy, however, because it's not very efficient. Instead, we use something called ATP. ATP is a highly useful energy source. It's sometimes helpful to think of it as a reusable packet of energy that can be charged and then uncharged when you use its energy. Your iPad holds a charge. After it's been hooked up to a power source for a long time, the battery icon would probably read 100%. But then you use your iPad for a whole bunch of different things, and gradually the battery wears down. So now your iPad would probably look something like this. Luckily, you can hook it up to a power source and then restore the battery to full capacity thereby restoring the supply of potential energy that's stored in your iPad. When the iPad has a full battery, it has lots of potential energy, but when it has a very low battery, there's almost no potential energy stored in it. ATP is a similar concept. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Here's a simplified version of what ATP looks like. It has an adenosine group right here, and then it has three phosphate groups that are all attached to the end together. The molecule in this form has a lot of potential energy stored in the bonds between the phosphates. Just like in the example with the iPad, ATP can have full potential energy or it can appear in a reduced form. So let's take a look at this bottom guy a little bit more closely and we're going to rename it. In its less powerful form, this end phosphate actually breaks away from the ATP molecule like this. When it only has two phosphate groups and has released energy, we call this ADP, or adenosine diphosphate, rather than adenosine triphosphate. This molecule can actually be recharged, however, but instead of plugging it into an outlet, we perform a different kind of process. We recharge the ADP molecule back into ATP during a process called cellular respiration. Then the cycle can begin again. Plants get their energy from photons of light coming from the sun. 
non-plant organisms get their energy from glucose. Unfortunately, your cells can't simply use glucose for energy or use photons of light for energy in a plant. They have to convert it into a form that they can use. ATP is an almost universal energy currency. You wouldn't be able to walk into any store in the United States and use a euro. However, you could take the euro to an exchange agency and convert it into about $1.25. It's still the same amount of money, it's just in a different form. Glucose is converted to ATP to make it easier for the cells to use it, just like we converted the euro into a dollar.